Okay, we'd like to welcome everybody here to this meeting. We're going to start with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Okay, I'm looking for an adoption of the agenda. Motion, Commissioner Drillette, supported by Commissioner Brown. All vote. Okay, it looks like the motion's gonna pass. If I had to guess, it passes. Okay, all right, public participation. Anybody from the public wish to address this board? You have five minutes if you do. Going once, going twice. Public participation is closed. Presentations, looking forward to this, a positive presentation by our clerk, Mr. Miller. Good afternoon, commissioners, thanks for having me. And uh, no doubt a lot of the stuff that was in our 100 day report, uh, which we, we marked 100 business days on April 17th, um, you guys have been really gracious with your time and allowed me to come before you and, and talk and was proud to come before the um, Older Americans Advisory Committee and Chairman Smith has heard part of this before. So uh, if he gets up and leaves, it's only because he's already been subjected to this, uh, this punishment. But, um, but it's our 100 day uh, and, and uh, so a lot of it, I'll, I'll be real quick because I know you got a, a long agenda, but um, thank you, I guess, for making my 100 days so grand. Get it, get it? But, but with all seriousness, and I know that it's a feeling that's, that's felt by uh, the clerk's office staff and a lot of our stakeholders, but through all the stuff that they've been through, um, the Board of Commissioners was always there uh, to lend us support and to get them through tough times and to help us rebuild afterwards. And uh, on behalf of the whole team that of 90 people strong, thank you very much for your, for your support, and uh, we, we really appreciate it. So this was just a way to kind of to put it out there. Um, you know, I, I, I put together some metrics, did some research, put together some numbers, got a nice little Macomb Daily story out of it. But then um, Karen goes on the lamb, steals some money, and she's on <laughs> two, four, and seven, top of the fold in New York Times. So maybe I need to go a little crazy to get a little attention around here, Commissioner Ha. But, but uh, with all seriousness, it's, it's just kind of a way to benchmark some of the work. So hopefully going forward, we can look back at where we were at 100 days and say, and hopefully come back, you know, maybe in two years, maybe later on down the line and say, um, show the progress that we've made. So you have, um, I guess by, by way of overview, um, like I said, we're, we're 90 team members when we're fully staffed. There's really four divisions, the elections department, which you know well, uh, register of deeds, vital records, and uh, our court section. We're spread out over three buildings in the Talmer building. We're in the first floor of the courthouse as well as in the uh, Market Street Clemens Center where the elections department is. We see over 101,000 people a day, or rather a year, excuse me, a year, but about 200 people a day come through the Talmer um, uh, uh, lobby over there. And, and one of the things that did catch the uh, media attention was the removal of the, of the um, metal detectors over there. And now, thanks to working with uh, facilities, uh, we have two uh, armed guards that are over there. One armed guard, but two guys who split, split the time, who help with greet the public and really give peace of mind to the employees uh, who are over there uh, in, in a really important way. So um, you guys have been very helpful. A as we came in, we had these expired contracts. I won't, go, won't dwell on that because we had briefed you on that before, but I'm really, really excited about what this could mean for our service delivery because we have gone out for an RFP. Not only are we saving significant dollars by uh, d making the decision to sunset the, the super index and, and all of that means, uh, but we're putting out for an RFP to have a combined platform for our vitals record, our vital record section as well as our deeds. The amount of changes that have happened within the industry since the county first had this contract some eight to 12 years ago, Crystal might know better than me, but um, is, is significant. And so it's really gonna uh, have a huge payoff in terms of convenience for the customer in that they're gonna be able to populate a lot of forms at home, send it to an electronic queue, show up and, and have it ready to go. As a so cut down on wait times, make it more efficient for us. And especially on the ROD side, when we, have, when we receive a deed to be filed, we really don't have any way to really track which one of our team is working on it when or, or frankly if a mistake is made or we need to go back and look at it, we have no way of knowing who made that. So it makes training or you know, double checking challenging. The new platform, whichever vendor we go with, we're gonna be able to figure out who had it at every step of the way. It's really gonna be, it's gonna revolutionize the way that we do business at, the, at ROD. 
Um, we're going to be able to pay for that part of that out of our tech fund, so it won't be a burden on the general fund, as well as if we incorporate some of our uh, CPL pistol license information into it, we'll be able to draw down some of our CPL restricted funds too, again, further relieving pressure on the general fund. We're uh, meeting with vendors next week, two vendors. We have three of them that are coming in for interviews, our current vendor, plus two other reputable firms who work with other counties throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, at the risk of putting you to sleep, I'm really, really excited about uh, that process and what it means. Um, let's see here. I want to talk about the, the, the cost savings. Uh, and sometimes this has been uh, like unraveling a ball of yarn. We had multiple fax services, for example, of ways that had systems that had been set up over time that uh, for whatever reason weren't sunsetted and weren't being used, but yet we were paying money. So we're kind of unraveling some of these, shutting down some systems, migrating to some in-house solutions uh, with the help of county IT. Um, all in all, it's gonna save us thousands of dollars a year. Uh, the big savings, as I alluded to, is, is sunsetting the super index, um, but uh, that's gonna save us some $30,000 a month. Um, but, um, you know, pretty exciting for, for enhanced delivery of services plus uh, reduced costs. Uh, the metrics I talked about uh, is really uh, as much about benchmarking for us so we can hopefully mark progress as we go forward, but we're, we're at a good place in terms of our turnaround for the court section processing documents as well as um, our wait times are all down from uh, a year ago uh, as well. So um, I, most, most importantly, I just want to say thanks for making this a part of the official record because we did put a lot of work into this, into this report and it's just a good chance to talk with you about it. Um, trying to think if there's anything coming up to flag for you. But anyway, it's in the report, you can read it, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, it looks like we do have some questions uh, starting off. Thank you, uh, Fred, excellent uh, report. Uh, Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, thank you for the report, uh, the transparency, I truly appreciate that. And I also appreciate that uh, you had mentioned um, about the cross training that you have in your uh, lean system, I believe it's called. Um, that's obviously is something that was important for the board members after what had happened in the past with the limited availability of employees to do this. Um, but I didn't see in your report, are you up to date? Uh, are you current with what's going on? Or are you, is there still a backlog? So there's no backlog. The lean system, uh, we, we, we process things. So to get, to get down in the weeds, um, the, uh, this was a decision made by interim clerk Kathy Smith was to bring back a retired employee who had been like the lean ninja, for lack of a better term, uh, a lady named um, Kathy, um, Kathy Dean, fantastic employee, really dedicated, and she comes, she works part-time, and it's almost like second nature to her. Now, we're working on training to get uh, people trained up uh, and, and the fact that she's no longer be able to be with us, but she just bangs through it really quickly. Um, I think currently, we're at like a three day, turn, a three business day turnaround on our lean entries. And um, I don't know if that's acceptable or not, I guess is the point. Is, is that in acceptable ranges? And, and again, I'm just, part of this is benchmarking it for, for future reference. I only know what I read in the, in the media, but that it had gone months without being entered. You know, it was a, it was a huge problem. So now we're keeping current on it uh, within three business days. So that's okay. orders that come down from the judge, get into the law enforcement network within three days okay. on, on, on The average. next question was the uh, other filing. I think it was e-filing or something like that. E-filing, yep. The, is that all up to date? We're at about, I know, as of today, we're Within at one day. We're at one day because the judges are on at a conference and there's been a, a kind of a lowdown, a, a, a tick down, I guess, in the activity. So we're like really current, uh, we're, we're filing motions that were put in yesterday. We're at a three day turnaround on average, a three business day turnaround on average. I will highlight as you guys go forward, I did notice that the, uh, and Former Clerk Smith highlighted this for me that you all, one of the supports that you had given her was that you had extended that overtime budget. We would not be able to be on top of the lien and, and e-filing were it not for that extra uh, overtime that we're allowed to, to give our employees because we just don't have the people to process it. We're getting between 300 and 500 motions a day that all have to be processed and in put into the court view system. And um, I'm proud that we can do it expeditiously, but uh, there is a cost to that. Okay, with that said, coming up from the budget season, if you could take a good look at that from 10,000 feet and see what we need to do to make sure that we're efficient in both of those areas. Um, if it's overtime you're thinking or once you're caught up and everything's good, you know, the right personnel, you're good to go. Um, because that was a big concern that everybody was bringing to the Board of Commissioners, those, those two uh, filings. 
Yeah. Well, I, I, what I'm seeing is that we rely on the overtime to keep it this current. And so absent bringing in additional capacity um, in terms of more employees that will be dedicated to doing just this work or continuing to rely on the overtime, that's the price of keeping current with this okay. stuff. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I guess I would ask then for you to then to get some historical numbers for the Board of Commissioners to take a look at where forget the past clerk, the clerk before, and if the numbers of uh, the filings or whatever you, you call it e filings were, were five thousand dollars, ten thousand, whatever the number is, to put a business case together to explain why that's still needed. Because our understanding was just to catch up to that point. If I may just make a point of information, uh, the previous clerk before Karen Springer was Carmela, and e filing had just really began. So unfortunately, the only data we had to go off of was the Springer years. So really, um, and that was a, uh, we know what the data was for that. So. Um, I, I think, I, I, if, if I may just say, as a practicing attorney who e-files all the time, I tell you the turnaround is much better than it was a year ago. That's a given. Thank you, Commissioner. It's, yeah, it's, it's something that, that's kind of evolving. Macomb was, there's, I'm gonna get the words wrong, but Macomb was a pilot county. We were one of the first counties to do e-filing. Now it's spreading to test counties or something. The, the second phase of their pilot has, still hasn't gone statewide. And we're talking about civil filings and domestic filings. So monetary lawsuits and divorces um, for in layman's terms uh, criminal is not being done by e-filing so it's still something that's being rolled out around the state and something that, that we're we're trying to figure out but there is a cost monetary uh, to to keep being current um, on it now a case could be made that that the and people who were there have made this case to me that during the recession it was before I was on the Board of Commissioners when there were drastic cutbacks that you all remember. The clerk's office did incur some of those cutbacks and that were, in their opinion, and I haven't looked at it apples to apples, were never restored. We're, we're never restored. And so I think that part of this, I mean, the, like I said, the, like the extra overtime is like purchasing, being current on it. So it's, it's something for us to talk about as we get into budget season. All set? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Fred. Excellent report. I had read, <laughs> well, I had printed and read the one you had sent us email. It blew my uh, printer up, but this, this one is much more concise. It, you had mentioned in here, in coordination with the Treasurer's Office, you're preparing to introduce a new campaign finance protocol to address both the existing and future campaign finance violations. Uh, if the number I read was correctly, it was somewhere in the vicinity of Two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. How are you coming with that? And and are you working with the Secretary of State? I assume. So uh, campaign finance viol campaign finance compliance is the uh, role of the Elections Department. That's under my jurisdiction. Um, once fines are incurred, um, it's our responsibility through sixty days to collect those fines. After sixty days, we turn it over, much like delinquent property taxes, to the Treasurer, and then they use their whatever means they have at their disposal to collect that. It becomes a debt to the county. Now it's both general fund revenue, it, it both goes to basically the same place either way. But there are in the list, and this, you know, historically, um, Treasurer Wabi and Clerk Sabaw had published the, the offenders mm -hmm. list in the newspaper and, and kind of tried to shame people in. But the people who are over 60, <coughs> the 60 day do, it, it's 250 to $350,000. Now some of it is frankly, um, uh, committees that were set up for a, a school bond um, that are reaching now twenty thousand dollars because infractions that occurred missed missed um, statements upon misstatements additional fees additional fines and snowballs and you know it's going to be up to the treasurer and corporation council if those are collectible or if we have to write those off but you know I think that there are there is a percentage out there of what those are collectible um, so to answer your question. Um, I think with it, pr probably next week, I think we're going to be ready to roll this out, uh, kind of a renewed effort to collect some of this. And really, it's, it's, it's not about bringing in the revenue as much as it is also ensuring transparency, making sure that right. people are held accountable to make sure that their reports reflect reality. So bringing that up to date, our staff is ready to help people do whatever they got to do. It's a renewed effort to kind of reach these people. And um, hopefully, employing a carrot and the stick approach, we'll be able to get some of that money in, clear up the books and then have a protocol going forward um, of the way the treasurer's office and the clerk's office can work together to make sure that it's that nobody falls between the cracks and we can stop 
these people who at this point are never going to be able to pay, frankly, right. probably, um, and get them early on and to prevent them from being in this situation. Are you aware of any protocol that says you cannot run for elected office if you have back campaign finance penalties? So my understanding, and I'm not an expert, but um, they make us, well, af before we s swear our oaths of office, we have to sign an affidavit saying that we're all up uh, to date on our campaign finance obligations. I remember being seated at, um, in the State House and our colleague, uh, former colleague George Cushenberry mm -hmm. uh, was a campaign finance guff law and then he sued them and there was a whole bunch of, I mean, he obviously was seated and had campaign finance violations. So um, I think that is a requirement that all of us who take office have to sign, but my experience, you know, witnessing George's situation is that I don't know how they can enforce it, but George is George, so that's another story altogether. <laughs> all together. Thank but you, to, to answer your question, I think that, that that is the law that, that we all have to uh, on our honor say that we're all up to date. Thank before you, we take Fred. office. Appreciate everything you do. Okay, Commissioner Drolet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Fred, thanks for uh, the report and for the $100,000 bar. I think Karen Spranger gave us after 100 days some crazy bread. <laughs> so, um, but just a couple uh, couple quick questions. One, um, the super index savings of, uh, you know, $30,000 a month, I may have missed that in your report, but what is the, what is the super index? You probably stated it and described it and I didn't connect it somehow. No problem, it, it's, uh, it's complicated stuff and it's a great question. So on f for our Register of Deeds side, so they, they hold um, all the property records, mortgage filings, liens, uh, deeds, all that stuff uh, is all recorded there. The super index was a platform that was brought on by Clerk Sabaw maybe about 10 years ago that offered a free search. It was powered by Google um, and people can go on, type in your name, your address, um, a host of other data, and just like a Google search that we use on our browsers can come up with, um, with property records. Under that platform, you could view an image of it, but to get, to get a copy, if you needed it for court or for whatever, uh, you'd, you'd incur the fee then. We also have a duplicative system, a, a duplicate system called U.S. Land Records, where uh, a lot of our institutional partners, law firms, title companies, will buy a subscription. They'll have a lower, uh, they'll have to pay a search fee, but they have a lower document printout fee. So if you're doing a volume of deeds, it makes more sense for you to do the subscription. So we have both of these. There's a free, there's a free aspect. So what precipitated the change was that Google came to us, uh, or when I came off, I became aware of this, that they were doing a, a big, a global change in their back-end technology. To, not to get too much into the weeds, they were going from their Google search platform to their Google Cloud. It's a larger technological change within Google. And then for us to migrate our platform for their new technology, we would have had to re-up our contract plus pay an additional several hundred thousand dollars to do that, to migrate that. Now, Google, you have the insurance, you have the assurance of the Google brand, um, the, the user friendliness uh, of, of the platform. But um, at the end of the day, it didn't make sense for us to continue it at such a huge price. Uh, Oakland County did, they, they decided to, to migrate there, and so they're still using that. How will citizens then get a document if they can't Google So it? we have uh, US land records at, at this point. Uh, people can come in, people can search their, their uh, records that way. You can do a name-based search for free. So if you're looking, if I'm looking up to see if anybody has filed any liens on my house, I just type in my name. And you type your name in the actual, not in Google anymore, but in, nope. you have so to go you, first you go to the to clerk's the website, and okay. then you go to the register of deeds, and, and there's an icon that says search property records, okay. and you can get to it that way. Okay. Uh, and previously there had been the two options to search, now there's only one option. Gotcha. So you go there, now you can do a free search by name, um, and then again, you, you can free search, and the, but if you want to download an actual document, there's a cost associated with that. Or for our, for our institutional customers, they can still do their subscription. Now what we are finding is, anecdotally, even our, our institutional customers, they'll purchase a subscription which will allow them a certain number of searches and a certain number of documents at a certain premium price. They'll pay a price for that. But they were using the super index to do their free searches in, ad in addition to their, um, their subscription, right? So we have heard some people who have, who have or be mourning the loss of it. Um, our hope is that with this new platform, we're gonna be able to kind of split the baby and be able to find a way to have low volume searchers, like our constituents who wanna check out on the status of their own property, um, to be able to do that for free. Probably still have a fee to print, print a document, but then also for law firms, realist, realtors, and um, 
title companies would still have the subscription option as well. Out of curiosity, what is the fee to print a document for the average citizen out there? Uh, it's six dollars, um, I believe, to, to print a print a document. Okay. Okay, and uh, thank you for answering that question. Uh, so, are we going to experience then that savings of a total of four hundred thousand dollars in in this year's uh, nineteen budget? Is that the anticipation? Or is yep, that uh, no, that, that's paid for out of the clerk's tech automation fund tech budget. So it's not a direct general fund uh, savings, but it's a direct savings to the to the tech fund, which we're able we cap. It's populated by state law uh, as deeds are recorded. Part of the fee goes to the state. Part of it goes to the county general fund, and part of it goes to this tech fund, which we're allowed to use for technological enhancements to improve service so it, it'll fund our help fund our next platform that we're that we're have the RFP out for now okay I among other that. things and, and the final question is um, has there been any any change resolution or development in the uh, in the issue of some of the staff wanting to be transferred over to the courts is that still a thing is there a decision that you've made in that uh, um, well what's when I first came in, I, I had had uh, it, was, it was one of the best things that I that I was told to do. I met face to face with all the staff, talked, gave them an open opportunity to talk about anything, um, particularly with the with the, the judicial court clerks. Um, they have very intense jobs, multitasking, dealing with attorneys, with judges, with um, other clerks. It's just it's an it's an intense, rapid job that, that takes a special kind of person to do it now they they feel and I, I believe quite rightfully that they are not compensated what they're what they're worth and so that there is there's a there's a angst among them about that and I, I were kind of refer them you know I'm not the, I'm not bargaining with their union that's the our HRLR does that and so I kind of I'm waiting to see where the and so my, my point being that is even if they migrated over to the court the courts not going to be able to do anything more than I can because this th their their units are bargaining right now maybe there'll you be a resolution it's a compensation that. thing then essentially but then why if they're going to get paid the same were they so anxious to get transferred over um, I mean my hope is that that with the changes that we've brought in in, tr in terms of being more responsive to employees engaging employees in ways that they haven't been engaged frankly in many years um, and and trying to put the employees at the center of, of our organization that it helps it helps mitigate some of the other Problems, um, other anxieties that they may have, that their discomfort. Um, there is there are, there are courts across the state that do it differently. We were over in Washington meeting with a clerk over there, and he said he, quote unquote, gave up his court employees to the court, and he, in his opinion, it was the best thing that he ever did, so he could focus on vital records and other stuff. Um, other other clerks, you know, I think it's the clerks association conversations that I've been privy to, where they view it as like a larger jurisdictional battle between clerks and courts across the state that we're getting way into the weeds here but I guess th it's, it's not as cut and dry so what, what I, my, my thought is I've got two years in this contract right? I got I got a two-year shot here I want to make it as see what what I can do within my power to make these people as as happy in their jobs as effective and as efficient so we can serve our primary customer the courts that would that they wouldn't want to leave maybe may, that's so that's my theory and, I, and I've been putting different things into practice uh, maybe the time will come they'll finish their bargaining raise or not and they'll still want to do that and then it was something that I would I would be open to and working with them because ultimately it's about serving the customers which are the public and the courts and um, if for some reason having us as administrators is somehow hampering that and they can do better I wouldn't be ad adverse to that but my theory is that there's stuff that we can do to communicate with them and empower them and appreciate them that that wouldn't be a moot point Okay. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to add a little bit to you, Leon. I, Fred knows that I don't don't li I didn't like the Google system at all. So right. you know, Leon, that's a great example there of a department head. I didn't like the Google system. I thought having two systems never made sense. And here we got a department head that said, you know what, we don't need the Google system, and we're using land records. And that, as you can see, that's the biggest savings on his chart there is the fact that we're not having Google as a service provider anymore. So really good job on that, Fred. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you. Just very quickly, with respect to the campaign violations, um, I know somebody that's never even formed a statement, a committee or a filled out a statement of organization, and they're in their second term. So they didn't sign the document. There's been no ramifications. I know somebody that f several times has gotten elected um, and then has several years, they don't file a single campaign statement 
until they have to run again. Then they go and they pay the fine and then they never file again. And it's, beca and, and it's because they know that there's no ramifications. Everybody knows that nothing is enforced. So um, even if you grandfathered those that have built up the thousands of dollars um, and started new, I, I would like to see the treasurer actively go after people. These are elected officials that are violating the law. I don't think we put out a notice clear enough that says you are violating the law. We're kind of nice about what we do. and. Um, um, so I would like to see you aggressively go after them that first 60 days. And if you aren't able to collect, I would like for the, uh, for the treasurer to do anything and everything he can, because once you set the standard, people will stop doing it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Commissioner. I would say I'm not a member of law enforcement, but if you know of a crime that's being committed, you may have an ethical responsibility to report it, but that's not me. That's not my jurisdiction. We'll talk afterwards. All right. Okay, Commissioner Sauger. Yeah, yeah, Fred. I think at the beginning of your your talk, you said you had security guards now over there. Are they the gray coats? Or? The, yeah, exactly. They're the gray coats. Yes. Okay, because the, the the gal that was in there before, I kept harping on it, wouldn't put nobody in. You you guys got a lot of money you handle there, and over the counter and whatnot. And was never was a security guard in there. But I'm happy to see it, and thank, thank God you got it. The, it gives the employees a great, great more uh, peace of mind. When we do our late office hours on Wednesdays, we do have a deputies that's stationed over there. However, they're subject to call if the dispatcher, if something happens in Mount Clemens, they're subject to responding to the call just like any other deputy. And so that's, um, but it's good to have them there as well. But this, having the day in, and, and the, I gotta give it to whoever recruited them, whether it was HR or whether it was facilities, the people that we have have been fantastic. They're, they've embraced greeting customers and directing them to our kiosks, and they're really, really great to have there. Thanks. Okay, any other speakers? All right, Fred, once again, I want to thank you. Uh, we used to thank say you, this Mr. to Karen Springer that, uh, you know, the clerk's office is the front line of government. Most people come and do a lot of stuff with government at the clerk's office. So you're doing a really good job. I hear that from the clerks. I hear that from the people on the street. I appreciate you as a department head cutting some costs where we can and consolidating. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll hope to see you at the 200 days. A motion to receive and file. Okay, we've got Carabelli, support by Sauger. All right, next item here is the Civil Service Commission. We have a 2018 annual report. Come on up. Yeah, let's do, before we begin, let's do a motion to receive and file. Moved by Don Brown, support by Commissioner Drolet. Please vote before we begin. Oh, it's a receive and file. I'm sorry, my mistake. I'm still a rookie. Thank you. You're a little taller Hi, how you doing? Go I'm ahead, did good. you press that? You did, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be here. The reason I'm so pleased to be here, I'm proud of what we do in civil service. So I hope you have a lot of questions regarding the report, and I hope you all have the report. Good. Um, it's a good place uh, to work twice a month. We come in. And that's, and I invite you to come and see us. We're there at the clerk's office over at the Talmer building, the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, nine o'clock, the coffee's always good and hot. And since I'm Irish, let me know ahead of time, maybe we could have an Irish coffee for you. Uh, speeds things along, you know what I mean? Anyways, we are in lovely accommodations, and, and I thank Fred for keeping it that way. We also have, from the clerk's office, probably the best secretary we have ever had, and I've been, I'm into my third term now, and I've seen them come and go, but um, Shirley Maniachi, if anyone knows her, is excellent. So, um, We've been trying to hold down our budget, but we've had a problem, and I'm just gonna say this stuff right out up front. 
so that you know where we're coming from with our budget. But uh, in the dispatcher's office, we've had a lot of people apply because we have a lot of people that get hired, they stay a month or two and they leave, just walk right out. And so that's costing us a lot of money. Um, when I go to proctor the video test that they have to take and pass, I always get up and make a little speech, tell them to focus and they'll get through this test, but please, I tell them, while you're watching this and filling out your questions, think about how you would feel if you were answering that phone. Can you handle the stress of this job? We're trying everything we can to keep people over there, but it's rough. It's, it's very rough. And the other thing where our budget went up is with our psychological exams. We had a great company over the years that gave us great rates. And then they decided they needed to make a little more money. So they dropped us. And we did, we looked for a long time for the cheapest one, but still were qualified to handle what we need for the sheriff's office. So that's higher. But other than that, we're, we're trying to keep the budget down and we're checking everything. Sometimes maybe we ride the sheriff's office a little too much, but hey, we try to do our job. So I gave you the bad news. Now, let me answer any questions you have with good news. Hey, Commissioner Carabelli again on the first round. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ma'am, thank you very much for what you do. We're truly appreciated by the board. Um, I do have a question though, and this is something that's been brought to our attention and I couldn't find the numbers in your presentation. Um, you have the numbers of applicants for the dispatch and then uh, after the testing and everything, you have the numbers of how many were qualified and you show also how many were hired. That's great. On the uh, correction officers portion, it shows that you had 142 applicants, 18 were hired but it doesn't show how many passed out of the 142 of your testing. Yeah, I don't have those numbers. Um, Ron? This is the, our other commissioner here, Ron Gimmel. Sorry, I right. should have introduced him. Dispatchers. Dispatchers. It's dispatchers. Because the reason why I'm asking this, because uh, the information, maybe it's in there and I don't see it, but it shows the dispatchers numbers, but it doesn't show the sheriff uh, uh, correction officers numbers and with that said the sheriff has told us that he doesn't have enough applicants to fill these jobs and sometimes they go unfilled because he's waiting for applicants uh, and yes we understand that some have withdrawn after they been offered the job or refused it but the amount of applicants of 142 how many passed and were eligible to be hired it would be great information when you get an opportunity well, when they pass, then they're put on a list. And they stay on that list, sometimes for quite a while, as many of you know. But uh, once we approve them, the sheriff's office then goes in to hire them. And then we do the, the physical test and the psychological test and then they get hired they go to work uh, let's see it it looks like a lot and it is a lot I think if I'm correct the number on that list that we come up with of suitable applicants for corrections 189 or 184. That's a lot of people on that list. So maybe the 142 is who's actually passing yeah. and ready to okay. be hired? So okay. it's, it's tough. We don't do the hiring. No, ma'am, I, I, I understand. I just, I, I look at the breakdown on page seven that uh, Commissioner Sauger had mentioned and it shows uh, at the top it says dispatch testing. And as you went down through it, 
It shows 115 applicants, 62 applicants passed, 42 failed, um, 11 applicants didn't show. So I see that yeah, out of 115, 62 of them were eligible to be hired. That little table there, you don't have it for the Sheriff's Department, and I was just curious, out of the 142 applicants that are on page, um, uh, on page number 33 of yours, and it'd be uh, 20, uh, of 21 of ours, it shows that in 2018, correction officer applicants received 142, but it doesn't say how many passed that were ready to be hired. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry, says. it says that there's 142 applicants received, but how many of those 142 passed your uh, testing and everything to be hired? Do you, when you get a chance, if you can find that number out, it would be appreciated. You know, um, do you have any idea? Um, no. Okay, all right, thank you. Know. But what I'd suggest, if you came to my meeting, our meeting, um, <coughs> get an Irish coffee, and we'll give you the exact figures. Thank you, ma'am. No, no problem, thank you. As of doing it right here, I don't wanna no, mislead you. No, no problem, when you get a chance, I'll, get, okay. I'll catch up, thank you. Okay. All right. yeah. But come see us. All right, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Kerberry raised a question. We've heard complaints that we're not getting enough applicants through the Civil Service Commission for them to hire. That's been a con concern we've heard several times. And the process is, is cumbersome and it takes too long to get people through the system. So that goes to Commissioner's questions about how many people are applying and, and what, the, what the food chain is. Because it seems we've heard from the other end of the pipeline that there's a problem in your civil service area that's not getting enough turnaround and giving enough qualified applicants to the people that need them. So that's the question. So when you get that figured out, Set us information and we'll be, uh, we'll have another conversation. Well, the problem is the applicants call the personnel department and then they contact us for rules and regulations how to apply. And they talk to Shirley, who is very good. She doesn't turn anyone away, she doesn't have the right to do that. We get what comes through the grapevine and we take everybody we don't discriminate or or anything so I, about the I'm frankly shocked tests? that someone would say that what about after the test to get them through their, their other tests and the psychological evaluations the physical tests the other components after is that how long does it take them to get through that section once they're put on the list yeah then the sheriff's office has the right to hire the people. We don't hire them, the sheriff's office does. Okay. But we have everybody give them a fair chance. We don't turn anyone away at our level. Okay. We Thank get you. them on the list, but if they can't pass the tests, like for example, the video test for dispatchers, they're not gonna get on the list to get sure hired. And, and the sheriff's office wouldn't want them anyways. Got gotcha. you, thank you very much. Thank you for coming down. Thank you for your information. You know, I thank wish you. we could hire all of them and get some of these lists down, to be honest with you, but okay. that's Commissioner just my thing. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Sauger. Probably the best way to ask this question coming from all of us, Diane, from the time a person goes up to your civil service board, fills out the application, how long does it take roughly before they take the test before the rest of the process is started? I mean, is there a long waiting period or is there a short? Uh, well, we try to keep it as short as possible so that we can get their names over to the sheriff's office. But but they, they got to have to take the test to, at your place. Is that correct? They come and say, well, let's stick with the dispatchers. You know, they talk to Shirley, our secretary. And she says, okay, you'll have to come in and take a typing test. Now, that typing test used to be done at the personnel department. So that would be another step, another day, but now she said, no, we're gonna do it here in the office. So Shirley administers the typing test to move things along faster. 
If they pass, then they're given the date of the next video exam. They come, they take the exam, it takes a couple of hours, and then we have to send those uh, papers in that they filled out with their answers to the company that did the video, mm -hmm. and it takes a little under a week to get the results back on all of them. And then they're notified. <coughs> so, um, Okay, because I'm, I'm astounded by this number of applicants taking the test was 115 and number of applicants that failed, 42. That was the written test they failed? Well, uh, what it is, it's the video, if you're talking about video I tests. don't know, I'm just looking at your sta statement we got in front of us. It shows 115 took, had, and 42 failed. Everybody takes the same test. I don't know if they're not studying because they're given the different books to read. They're encouraged to, to study the books and we can't force them to do uh, their homework. I know, I, no, I know it's not your fault. I'm astounded by that figure. As I many. know, so are we. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> but we would like to get these guys promoted it's, see, the civil service is actually, it was started by the state of Michigan to protect the workers in the different sheriff's offices. So even though they have a union, which is a good union, we hardly ever have people come to talk to us with their complaints. Wish they would more, but you know, uh, the people administering the tests at the sheriff's office, tell them over and over, come on guys, gals, start studying. These tests aren't hard. Every question comes from these books. It's quite frustrating. Our job, civil service, is to keep them happy, make sure that they're getting the right uh, information that they need these tests are not that hard. You do have to study, though, like for any test. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so Commissioner Hoff. I don't know. I feel like Hoff? shaking them, and that <laughs> wouldn't be right. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Hoff. Mr. Chair. Um, Marvin, if I could touch on that. Uh, I think you said 115 and 42 did not pass the test. They failed. Failed. I said on the Act 78 board, and I know it's not civil service, but we advertised for police and fire. And in doing so, we had 31 applicants come in and take the written tests. Of the 31 that took it, 26 failed the written test. And then of the remaining five, all five of them failed the background check. So it's trying to get every municipality, I believe, in Macomb County is trying to hire police and fire right now. So they're all out shopping the best deal and I, without violating confidentiality. One of the persons that failed the background check was an existing police officer. Had two felony convictions that he did not identify on his application. So I understand the difficulty you're having. I don't think it's the test. Uh, even with the standards having been lowered in the last five years, there's still a need for those that want to be police, uh, we'll just say first responders, as well as dispatchers. We're having difficulty, as well as every other surrounding community, trying to fill those positions. Our entire time frame, from day of advertising, if we could get the person through the process was 90 days, which is not a great period of time when you're looking at a written test, a background check, a psychological evaluation, and a personal interview with the chief. So thank you for all that you do. Yeah. Well, at okay. civil service, thank one you, Mr. Thing, Chair. You're welcome. I'll just mention, um, we do try to help everybody. For example, we had a gentleman apply who was colorblind. 
So there was a big debate about that. And then I heard on TV that there is something you can do now that they've come up with a type of glasses that will correct that. So at our very next meeting, I brought it up. Let's have it here for people and also at the sheriff's office so they'll know we don't have to worry about people that are colorblind anymore if they get these glasses. So oh. we okay. have these little bits of information <laughs> that we try to get everybody in a position. Okay. Well, thank you. I think what we're going to try to do is maybe one of these days get down to your place and uh, have some Irish coffee. Mm. You know what I mean? So thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. We already have a motion on this and we've received it. So thank you for your report. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay. We need a motion now. We're going to go into closed session. This is, I want to clarify a couple things. We, we didn't vote on this. We didn't vote on yeah, we did. We just did. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, okay. yeah. Great. I'll yeah. plug in something in. <laughs> All right. Just to make a point here, the um, there was a department recommendation for the appointment of independent counsel by the prosecutor's office that was not put on as a bypass item. It was just added on to this agenda. So I want everybody to know we didn't do that in a bypass fashion, but we did add it on because it was requested yesterday just before this meeting. Now, we do have a memo from our independent counsel regarding this. So I would like to go into closed session, so I do need a motion for a closed session. Commissioner Gillette, supported by Commissioner Lacido. Okay, all right, back on the record, we have a department recommendation here from the prosecutor's office. Uh, go ahead, Josh, come on up. Good. Yeah, push that red button so we can hear your. There you now go. Now it's red. I heard red button earlier, but I didn't press it. Good afternoon. Are you expecting a presentation from me? Well, <laughs> listen, yeah, I know. We, we did receive a memo from you. I think everybody's had a chance to read it. We know what your request is. I, what's that? Okay, so I, what I, I will go ahead, obviously. No, okay, don't? All right, okay. So what we're going to do, we're, we're well versed on what's going on to let you know. We're well aware of what your request is. We're well aware of what your concerns are, okay? We've had our own, sorry to say, our own independent counsel here help us out with this matter. So, and as you are aware, we've had a very lengthy closed session to discuss this. So um, unless there's anything else you think you should add or want to say, um, you know, I think we're prepared to make a motion on this. Well, I'll just, I'll just note, I, I was provided with the uh, information regarding Corporation Council's memo. Um, and so I would just note that the, uh, the memo clearly doesn't uh, dispute that there's a conflict. Um, the memo also uh, tends to focus only on the request as if it's one just for general counsel. But this is not a request just for general counsel. We are seeking um, to retain counsel to bring a declaratory or injunctive action. Um, and it will be strictly to uh, clarify or enforce the rights of the prosecutor in his office. Um, aside from bringing an action, we also would like to replace corporation counsel on pending cases that they're actively working on due to the conflict since they won't withdraw. Um, there's at least three cases now that we know of, um, and uh, I, I would imagine that's all of them. Um, and so for those three cases, you know, th there's a statute, um, MCL 49.73, that requires, because the prosecutor's office or prosecutor is a defendant, um, that requires the board to grant outside counsel for those cases. Other than that, those are the only um, issues I wanted to make sure that I brought up regarding corporation counsel's memo. Um, further, I, the charter itself, th this board knows, the charter itself gives this board authority to um, appropriate money. It gives the board authority to um, it, it, I think the, the gist of Corporation Council's memo was that um, there's nothing in the charter that gives the board the authority to grant the money. Um, and therefore, because there's nothing in it, the board can't do it. Unfortunately, it, it's completely wrong. The provisions of the charter specifically state this charter, if there's anything the board could do that's not included in the charter, then it's assumed that it is in the charter. And that's 4.5, I believe, um, and one point. Uh, two also gives the board authority to make those decisions. So uh, 
I, I, I agree that the, that the specific statute 6.6.5 of the charter, uh, rather the statute, sorry, says that you know you, you can't just have general counsel, um, but that's not the portion that we're asking for um, uh, uh, advice or counsel on. So let me understand so, your request. There are three pending cases. Do we have those pending cases? Uh, I think you, there's, the, I can give you the pending cases right now. Three pending cases are uh, court of appeals case, three court of appeals cases. One is Trendle v. Hackle, the other is Williams v. Smith, and the third is Maynard v. County Macomb, which is the uh, originated as the FOIA lawsuit, uh, but is still uh, pending in the court of appeals. So Corp Corporation Council can't move forward with that one, and perhaps the decision would be made not to, but without talking to council first, we won't know. Okay, and then so your request, you talked about pending cases. Those are the three pending cases. Those are the three that we know of. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I got Leon. Go ahead. Thank you. And you already asked one of the questions, which is what are the three cases that were pending? Uh, and I don't think there's anybody on this board, at least that I'm aware of, doubts that we have the ability and the authority within the charter to appoint independent counsel. We've done it in the past. No one's contested it then. And I agree with your interpretation of the charter. So that's not okay. a question. And I don't, um, I, I would be, in, in, the request before us is for, any pending cases and any other cases, I would be inclined to potentially support this if I was, if the pending cases were delineated in the specific request and we were to appoint four specific cases, I'd be inclined to support that. But at this point, it's very open-ended. So um, I just wanted to make that statement that I think the board as a, a, a group does though agree though we all have the ability to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Is there a motion anybody wants to make with regard to that? Go ahead, Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I make a motion to deny the request of the prosecuting attorney for the reason number one, I would like to state on the record that the County Board of Commissioners has full legal authority to appoint independent counsel through the charter and through Michigan compiled law. With that said, the petitioner is encouraged that if they, br they should bring back a request for independent counsel on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, there's a motion and support. Go ahead, Commissioner Kleinfeld. He, re he referred to FOIA. Is it the same case? It's, it, be no, no. It was filed completely separate. It wasn't added on. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a motion on the table. Let's call it to vote. The motion is to deny, but with the specific understanding that this board has authority to appoint independent counsel, and this board is instructing the petitioner, in this case here, the prosecutor's office, to come back with any pending cases on a case-by-case -case analysis to, for us to consider whether or not independent counsel will be appointed on that. Yes. Point of clarification. Yes. The mover did indicate in the motion that we are all in agreement we do have authority to appoint legal counsel. That so there is, was two attributes there. Right. There's two attributes to that. That's correct. You're welcome. Okay, the motion passes 12 to 0 with one abstention, which is Chairman Smith. Thanks, Josh. And Josh, just so you know, you understood what we're saying, right? Make sure you understand what, you understand what we said. I understand what you're saying as far as the pending cases. What I, how I can come back to you with a case that we want to bring without consulting with legal counsel is beyond me. So, so our motion was to bring a suit pursuant to the charter and that's being denied, so. Yeah, well that narrows it down a little bit, we understand, but uh, you, you understand there's three cases pending, do what you gotta do, you know what I mean?
All right, uh, let's move on now. We have uh, some correspondence. I'm looking for a motion to receive and file these correspondences. Liz Lacido and Commissioner Ha, in their entirety. Yeah, you got a question, Mr. Caramelli? Yeah. Item number uh, uh, 8A is a request uh, yeah. from Commissioner Golat uh, on the study. Um, this came directly from finance. This does not include what was budgeted. I just want to make sure we make that very clear. Thank you. Okay. Well noted. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Brown. What are you saying? That report was the amount of money that was spent, right? That was spent, money spent. Is that right? $25 million. It's not telling you of a, a possible emergency repairs. It's not telling you operating and fixing normal. Maybe it's tuck pointing. I mean, just mm -hmm. those are capital. $25 million isn't enough for you, apparently. Well, that's it's the pretty point. <laughs> this is the point I'm trying to make. Pretty big number. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Well, well Thank noted. You. Well mo noted. Make sure. Uh, well, we need a written request going in to clarify that instead of just talking about it. So I'm going to make that written request. You want to make a motion for? No. Okay. You'll right. make it. Thank okay. You. okay. Right. We'll know for the record that Commissioner Carabelli is going to make a written request with respect to that uh, item 8A. Fair enough? Okay. Let's take a vote on the receive and file. Okay, motion passes. All right. New business. Anybody have any new business? Commissioner Haw? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this morning at our retirement board meeting, there was a presentation by the actuary who identified longevity, service retirement uh, by department, broke it down, mortality rates. Um, <coughs> this keeps coming up quite frequently in a lot of our dialogue. So without objection, I'd like to present the entire document to Jim, uh, Commissioner Carabelli, excuse me, and if he sees value in it, have this actuary who's being paid for by the board come in and make a 20-minute presentation because th this is what's transpired over the last five years and they're already working on a future document. So without objection. Is there a particular committee you want to have it on? Uh, government oversight. Okay. Commissioner Brown, he he's gladly accepts. Okay, I will make the request. Okay. One last thing. Sure thing. Following my good friend here with his granddaughter, my 13-year-old granddaughter who lives in Macomb Township, auditioned to sing the national anthem at Jimmy John's Field. There was 300 auditioners she was one of the five chosen so we're looking very much forward to that day so thank you okay commissioner sauger you got some new business yeah i just want to wish the two female commissioners happy mother's day on sunday All right, all right, public participation, seeing that there's nobody here, I'm gonna ask once, twice, thrice, it's closed. Finally, a motion to adjourn, Commissioner Jolette and Commissioner Mijak, sorry, Andre. <laughs>